Hi, everybody, and welcome to the International Market Series. Today, we will be focusing on the Latin America market. And joining us today, we have our hosts, myself, Joe Kim, and Josh Burns. And our guests include Alejandro Gonzalez and Jairo Nieto from Jam City, Bogota, based in Colombia, and Carlos Estiga Ribia from Lockwood Publishing, based in Brazil. And Carlos, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> For an American, yes. For an American, okay. yes. yes. It is to get here, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And key areas of focus for our discussion today include first, an overview of the overall market for LATAM, key local game studios and publishers, content and distribution trends, and keys to success for the market. However, before jumping in, Alejandro and Jairo, can you guys give us a really brief, brief introduction on who you guys are and what you do at Jam City? Sure. Uh, my name is Alejandro Gonzalez. I, I'm a, a co-GM uh, along with Jairo uh, for uh, Jam City Bogota. We are the a studio uh, from the Jam City team that's responsible for World War II, which is um, a mid-course strategy game that was recently launched uh, globally. I don't know, Jairo, if you want to well, give more context. If Alejandro is the co-GM, of course, there has to be another one. So I'm the other <laughs> co-GM. Uh, along with Alejo, I also function as creative director uh, of the studio. Uh, and yeah, as Alejo said, we're responsible for World War II, uh, one uh, competitive game that, that we developed uh, with, you know, uh, in, in Bogota with the help of, of, of a lot of other people around the world in the Gem City family. And glad to be here. All right, and next we have Carlos. Can you also just give us a brief intro on your background and what you do? Sure, of course, yeah. Uh, I've been doing games working uh, for uh, 25 years almost. So uh, I started uh, back in 96 with my own company. Uh, stayed with it until 2006. Then I sold it to a publisher. Uh, then I, I was the head of EA, it's mobile here it's for the studio side. And in the past years, I've, I've been helping some of the companies abroad to uh, set up here or to sell and uh, publish their titles here. And uh, it's currently, I am the uh, GM for as Lockwood Publishing, uh, helping them to uh, publish a game called Evakin, Evakin Life here. Uh, and I'm uh, is taking care of uh, basically all of the markets from as Mexico up to here. So basically this is what I'm doing now, the business. Got side. it, great. So given that, let's go ahead and get started, Josh. Awesome, thanks to guys so much for uh, for joining us. So I think the first section that we'll focus on, uh, just helping people better understand the market. Um, you know, obviously our first, first uh, edition of this podcast is focused on Japan, which is his own country. But now we're focused on a, you know, a large region. So want to look at kind of understanding uh, the different countries that make up Latin America, as well as then, you know, thinking about different, you know, gaming platforms. Um, so I pulled together some sort of basic numbers. Uh, you know, this is just for context. So Latin America, roughly like around 10% of the world's population, uh, based on new zoo numbers, which uh, the only thing we could sort of find quickly was a little, little out of date. It's around 5% of the, of the global gaming uh, sort of market revenue. Um, and it's growing uh, in line with kind of the overall like global sort of growth rate. Um, so, you know, would love to hear from folks about the different platforms. I mean, obviously, we, most people are focused on mobile now, but you guys are in the market. You're seeing, uh, you know, people play games. Um, you know, from what I see, there's actually a lot of activity on uh, PC uh, games as well as on console games. Um, and we'd love to kind of hear some more insights, you know, from the country level, like you guys are obviously in different countries, you understand the different countries that make up the region and which ones are the largest. Um, so kind of dive into that area a little bit uh, to initially start. I guess, Carlos, I'll kind of maybe go to you first, okay. um, just because you're first on, on, the, on the conference. <laughs> on the, uh, so, okay. so there you go. You're, any, <laughs> what are your thoughts around these topics? Okay, uh, well, the, uh, here we have a very big uh, a number of people that I play because we are a very a young as population. Uh, the a PC uh, here people they uh, I do play a lot in the a PC. Also on 
as console. But it's interesting because some of some of the people here they don't have money to get like the uh, the a PS4 or the Xbox One. So you can still see people uh, playing PS3, Xbox, the uh, 360 uh, old old one, uh, and uh, and the uh, PC is also king here. So and the uh, free to play games for a PC have been growing super fast. So now everybody is playing as Fortnite uh, uh, and some other games. Uh, Law and and some of, of those other games and of course it's for the mobile it's just it's taken over but uh, people they uh, do play uh, both it's not that people who play in the PC they are not playing on their cell phones but the mobile is really growing super fast in the in the past years like really really fast. Got it. Because one of my understandings is the to purchase the console it's incredibly expensive right because of yeah. like the duties and these kind of things in a lot of the countries if you so. do it legally yeah <laughs> there's a lot of this actually there's there's like a black market in a lot of these countries where you where there's like these places where there's like tax-free quote unquote uh <laughs> spots where you could can buy um games and there's a lot of piracy also in latin okay and is that because of the costs to import the real thing is so high as well as kind of like the sort of purchasing power or whatever you want to call it for, you know, people in a lot of these countries. I that think that one, one of the things is, is that um, devaluation is kind of a constant in, in LATAM. Like uh, you can see any given country and I've seen posts from many of my Brazilian friends or Argentinian friends and Colombia, like we just had like a very big big hit last week. Uh, many of the countries, especially the ones that are dependent on oil or other natural resources, uh, take a very big hit when those markets uh, go down. So right now, for example, oil prices are at like 20 year low or 10 year low, and and that really hits uh, the the markets. So makes anything imported just extremely expensive or increasingly expensive, and and that kind of is a concept for like consoles uh, or, or high-end PCs or high-end mobile. Got it. Because essentially everything's being imported into, into all of these sort of countries. And so you're paying duties and things like this if you do it uh, not in the, in the appropriate, appropriate exactly. ways. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's also like the certain distributor, like I, I think there's a limited number of distributors of the, like, of the, for the official channels. And that they also control prices, and and sometimes it's you know it's there's not a lot of competition. I would say, at least from what I from what from what we can see in Colombia. Got it. And uh, touching on PC gaming, just quickly, so people understand. So, um, you know, uh, from my understanding, a lot of the history in PC games is like a client games, so like a free to play kind of PC MMO type stuff. I mean, is Steam. Uh, and sort of like premium PC games or like what's what are what are people playing in a lot of the markets uh, in in Latin America? Okay. Uh, yeah. No, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, but here we can uh, we can buy from Steam. Uh, there are also some uh, local shops, local e-commerce portals here. Like there's one called uh, called N U U V E N Nuven which is like a competitor for Steam. Uh, basically, people play a lot of uh, soccer, uh, football games here. It's Counter-Strike back in the 90s until now. So it's uh, a shooters. It's, uh, everybody loves it. Uh, and some of the top games out like uh, uh, the Call of Duty, GTA. So all of those titles that are uh, top hits in the US, they are also... A top hits here, so we have like the same taste. We uh, pretty much follow all of the top publishers in the U.S. and in uh, Europe as well. Yeah, there's there's a it, there's a little bit of a, a distribution of or a phenomenon that that varies from country to country and even from city to city uh, regarding the how popular internet cafes are for PC gaming. So, for example, um, in Peru, there's there's a lot of like internet cafes, and and uh, that that uh, was one of the big contributors of uh, the popularity of games like Dota in Peru. So, for example, uh, a lot of the big teams in Dota that come from Latin America are either from Peru or Brazil. Uh, and I, I think it, it it's in part because of they have like a very strong uh, internet cafe culture. 
while in Colombia we don't have you know there's uh, there's few and far like uh, gaming cafe internet cafes pretty much everyone plays from 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 home. Uh, but that, again, that varies from city to city, and I think that that also changes a little bit in the sort of games that that people end up playing. Uh, but I would agree that mostly in, in the rest of our, of Latam, uh, it's a lot of the free PC games are big: League of Legends, Dota, Paladins, uh, you know, Fortnite, of course, for the younger audience. Latin America as a whole has like a younger population, like a, a, a age average. So I, I think that also contributes a lot to. Uh, the volume in gaming and uh, definitely FIFA and other uh, every football game is is king here. There's there's this like this market of uh, players that exclusively play FIFA, and there's this huge debate and memes if those are actually gamers or not uh, between the <laughs> between the gaming community. Yeah, awesome. So basically, the the cafe uh, PC cafes is still quite big in certain cities and regions within Latin America. Yeah. Okay, interesting. That makes sense because a lot of the top games seem to be those kind of free-to-play MMO type games, which historically like were very popular in that uh, in that environment. Um, cool. So let's talk about mobile gaming. Obviously, Carlos mentioned that this is kind of you know like everywhere else, you know, the, the sort of main growth area. Um, you know, is what do you what have you guys seeing in, in terms of that? I mean, obviously, we look at Brazil and. You know, it's one of the top countries, especially for downloads. Just huge, yep. uh, huge performance there. Um, you know, what do you what are you guys seeing in the in the market? Is that pretty consistent across all the countries? Um, Alejandro, I'll go to you first. What are your thoughts around that? You know, locally, what you see, as well as kind of looking at the whole region. Well, I think that mobile is pretty ubiquitous in in the town, and I think that that uh, carriers made uh, like a solid job of trying to put a mobile phone into everyone's pocket. And I think that that uh, access to, to mobile right now is uh, as at the, almost as high as the population. Many people have more than one uh, cellular phone. Uh, in tandem, obviously, uh, operators try to sell mobile plans. In LATAM, one of the things, though, is that uh, at least what we see in Colombia, and, and we've seen that from feedback from a lot of players, is that a, a, obviously Android dominates uh, that market over over iOS, uh, just giving the, the access to lower end, uh, cheaper or lower cost devices. Uh, and at the same time, a l- lower uh, access to lower cost uh, mobile plans. So a lot of people are on like a prepaid uh, plans uh, rather than postpaid uh, plans with like unlimited gigabytes or whatever. So access to data, although it's pretty big and, and I, I think that in many countries, especially in, in the cities, is not bad in terms of bandwidth. Uh, just the, the sheer cost of data for a lot of players make it a little bit prohibitive. So we see that that uh, players at least kind of on, 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 on our end, what we see from our players is that people complain a lot when they see like big downloads or games that have like a gigabyte uh, front uh, loaded uh, 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 entry wall, Th- those become kind of like a uh, barriers for, for players still in that time. Got it. Yeah, it was interesting. We'll, and we'll talk about this a little bit later uh, is that, you know, a lot of the most popular games are built in like, a, you know, areas like Southeast Asia or Asia, like the, you know, say like from Garena where they have the same issues with data is concern for people and they probably have done a great job optimizing, um, you know, around that. So, you know, that users can enjoy those games and not be worried about, uh, you know, data usage, which, you know, obviously here in the U S at this point is uh, not something most people, you know, have to think about. Um, so that's interesting. Other thoughts on mobile gaming opportunity. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that something that, that we are seeing here is that uh, Brazilians, they always played like a lot, but uh, for free-to-play games until, I think, two years ago, it was very hard to make them to actually spend any money in the games. And I think that this is part of this uh, a culture of the a piracy back from the a premium games. But then since people started to really spend money in some of the subscription services for uh, a music video, they started to also think about, okay, if I'm spending like uh, uh, 40 minutes or even more in uh, some of those games, why not start to uh, 
spend money. So even though, of course, here, if you if you take a look of, at the ARP DAO, it's like uh, five times less than in some of the top markets, but it's not that bad. Now you can, like, and uh, for the game uh, that, for that I'm helping here, we are really uh, doing fine. We are one of the top 15 now, at like 20, 15. And so uh, th this is something that, that we always tell people that now uh, you can make money here. It's, it's not like in four years ago that was virtually only ad-based. Now uh, IAP is really starting to, uh, to uh, grow. And uh, we do have some people that are spending big money in the game. So that's something that is it's, uh, a trend from the past years that I think is worth sharing. I, I I would add something that that is 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 uh, is part of like the Latin American culture, which is the social closeness. Uh, usually, we live like, like just from the get go, we live longer in our households than in other countries. For example, you know, it's it's not unusual for someone in their late twenties, early thirties to still live with their parents, which also means they're still living with their siblings, which makes everything that you know every, all content that they get their hands on uh, easier to transmit you know, via word of mouth to other people that are in their immediate circle uh, and spend a lot of time together. And there, so there's like this, there's like this opportunities also for content that is, that, uh, that leverages on the social proximity and the, like the social customs that we have in Latam that I think is not, you know, is, is, uh, uh, until now, not, not a lot of companies have uh, uh, taken advantage of. Got it. Um. So, yeah, I mean, one, I think that's an interesting thoughts, just giving us an overview. Does it seem like most of the growth is going to come from, uh, you know, the per user sort of, sort of revenue growth seems to be coming more from sort of people becoming more comfortable spending money. At this point, my assumption is, you know, people have a, most people have a device um, and that, you know, growth of downloads and revenue isn't really going to be driven by, you know, getting more devices in people's hands. Um, would you guys agree with that from the mobile gaming side that's really getting people more comfortable with spending like um, you know Carlos has mentioned? I, I think that there's kind of two factors to it. Obviously, one is the cultural factor. I totally agree the, with it, Carlos. And uh, usually you start seeing younger generations be a lot more um, uh, okay with the spending uh, real money in, in virtual goods. Uh, I think that, that there is like a big um, cultural block for older people uh, where if you grew up buying uh, uh, vinyl records or CDs or or getting kind of physical goods, even if it's just content and uh, uh, holding that, that physical good, going into the transition, uh, it's hard. Although OTT services like Netflix, Spotify, all of those help kind of break that barrier. But um, for kids, uh, younger uh, kids that grew up with uh, Minecraft or Roblox or now Fortnite, they do see a lot of value in their B box, you know, and 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 they start seeing that that actual money uh, can transform or should transform into a virtual uh, currency in their games, and that's okay. And the other side of the coin, which has been changing a lot since, uh, at least since we got into uh, games, uh, we started uh, with Hydro around 2010 when there was like the social games um, hype, uh, and in that time you'd see a uh, company like Mentis or Boss to uh, uh, pushing uh, in that direction. The biggest barrier would be access to um, payment mechanisms to credit uh, cards uh, or to that kind of stuff. That has changed a little bit. Uh, and I would argue that right now, a lot more people have access to, to, to electronic uh, money, like to uh, credit cards, but still a barrier. You, you'd be surprised of how many players don't have access to that. And how some of the mobile platforms still do not support a lot of alternate uh, payment mechanisms. That, that I think, is still uh, a, a barrier for people who could potentially spend uh, on mobile games but are not doing it. There's, I think there's also an element that happens a lot in Latin, which is that because of, of how, you know, how there's usual, like wealth is distributed, you find cases where there's one guy that is actually financing the whole group. 
uh, and and uh, you know, the, and kind of laughs because uh, I know yeah. he did that, right? There's like this player that that is that is actually paying for his friends, uh, you know, either subscriptions or playtime or, or or currencies or helping them, you know, catch up faster. Uh, and it also has to do a lot with with what Alejo mentioned, which is uh, you know, a lot of these players either don't have access or to the credit cards or or have not been bankerized, or they just simply don't do not have the purchasing power yet. And there's something in that mix of the how Latin Americans come together and and help each other to actually be able to play and spend money uh, that again is is probably like a latent opportunity there. Awesome. All right, let's. Uh, I'm gonna pass over to JK to get into the next section here, so we can keep uh, moving along. Uh, but yeah, lots of great insights on the market. Cool. So yeah, the next question is really about some of the local companies in Latin America, and the biggest company that we've heard a lot of news about is, is certainly Wildlife Studios, famous for Tennis Clash. But can you guys talk to us about other companies that are successful or potentially the companies that we should be watching out for that could be that next big success in LATAM? Yes, uh, let me start here. Uh, there, I in, let me start with some first within the mobile industry. Uh, there's a company here called Fanaty. Uh, F-A-N-A-T-E-E. They are uh, specialized in, uh, it's like a crossword games. They, they have a game called Cody Cross, which is quite popular here. And it's growing fast now in some other, in some other countries, even in France, Italy. So uh, they have done like two or uh, three titles. And it seems like this uh, a new game, like it's not new, but it's the is the most new game. It's uh, it's really doing uh, fine. So they are certainly uh, a company that I think we should be keeping on uh, a, a, like a close la- a close eye on. Uh, there is also a company called uh, Akiris. Uh, so they are uh, a company that they were famous uh, for doing a game that was like one of the, the top hits on. Uh, iOS called Horizon Chase. Chase. Uh, yeah, Chase. So this is a very good game. Uh, they ported it to the uh, Switch and to uh, PlayStation, and they are now doing uh, uh, other games in uh, its co-production with companies like Scopely. So I can see it like, but uh, but they uh, managed to uh, go from the a premium game to the free-to-play, doing stuff with a very very as good publisher so i think those two companies are growing i can see they i i think they are in the uh, right path and there are two uh two others that they are not uh doing games like they are on games but uh i think it's it's important to tell one of them is named uh is, is called octagon and they are doing uh like the a live ops for several games abroad. So they are they are handling like the all of the production for games like the uh, puzzle quest for Magic. So it's it's the kind of company but that you don't that you don't hear uh, often because they are uh, working in the uh, back end. But they are it's really uh, getting a lot of new clients and only doing stuff for other publishers, so it's a company that I think people should be paying attention to. And uh, a final one is called is Koku, uh, K-O-K-K-A-U. They are uh, focusing more in the PC and uh, console doing like uh, external dev for a double A titles. They are not yet doing uh, like a triple A, but they are really doing fine. So those are the four companies that I know that I think we will hear a lot in the in the future, in the near future in Brazil. Got it. And, uh, Alejandro so, or Jairo, do you guys yeah. have any names that we should be aware of? Sure, uh, definitely. Well, uh, of course, uh, Jamsi is uh, based uh, here in Bogota. We also have operations in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, and, and all in all, it's a fair a significant amount of people between the two studios, uh, Bogota Studios is creating Kind of um, uh, uh, World War II, as he mentioned, uh, and and it's uh, been growing uh, teams in in both uh, countries uh, pretty healthily. Uh, besides that, in in Colombia, there are studios like Effecto Studios or Terravision Games that do like fantastic job uh, creating 
games, they've been focusing a lot in work for hire. Um, and, uh, and, and so you don't hear about them for a lot, but they've been working on pretty interesting titles. Uh, Aquiris in Brazil, as Carlos mentioned, uh, also a uh, pretty notable in uh, Uruguay independent studio called Ironhide. They've yeah, been Ironhide. Uh, making games Love for them. a long time. Yeah, and, they're and, so uh, good. Yeah, they, they made um, Kingdom Rush uh, and, uh, and uh, Iron Marines more re- recently. Uh, they're awesome. Uh, also in, in Uruguay, there's um, casual games company, Pomelo Games. They're pretty cool as well. And Mexico, uh, Hyper Beard guys, uh, they make a game called Kleptocats that's also uh, done uh, pretty well. So you see, like, basically uh, two uh, groups. Oh, I forgot, I would, of course, uh, Nimble Giant. Uh, Nimble Giant in Argentina. Yeah, I was going to I, I add yeah, Nimble the, Giant for sure with Quantum Leap. Yeah, they they are one of those companies that that is kind of trying to to transform from a, a work for hire mainly company to making independent games. They're focused a, a lot more on PC and and console, but but have worked on on mobile as well. Uh, but but you see kind of two groups of companies: one that that have focused and have grown quite a bit doing a work for hire, working for third parties like Aquis or Nimble Giant or Effecto. And other companies that have tried to uh, remain a little bit smaller, but have been a lot more faithful to creating their own IP and uh, as independent studios, as you see, like with Ironhide or Hyperbeard. I would add, I would add to the mix, definitely Dreams Incorporated from Colombia. Uh, they're working on this uh, amazing uh, RPG, like like it's like a love letter to to the old JRPGs. Uh, it's really fantastic. It's called Chris Tales. Really look out for that one because I think it's going to be a make uh, make a big splash. Um, and uh, I, there's another uh, studio in Bogota that I have a lot of uh, faith in uh, called Mad Bricks. Uh, these guys are super super talented. They, they, they they're still they're still small. Uh, they're, uh, but but like you look at every product that they create and it has a lot of polish and a lot of and it's they're very smart. So I would add those two into the mix, definitely. Yeah, Matrix does a hyper casual, so it's pretty different to to the other companies. And then from a capabilities or specialization and expertise perspective, would you say Latin American game developers have a specific focus, whether it comes to like a, you know, whether it's a certain kind of technology or art or specific kinds of genres? Is there any areas of specialization? I would say from the creative side, I would, I would, I would say that just as in other uh, creative ventures, I think we're very strong in narrative Um, and uh, you know, all types of narrative, not just like storytelling, but like context. And, 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 and I, if you look at, at all, like pretty much all the companies that we have listed here, their, their, some, their narrative is somehow very unique and that's what sets them apart from, from, you know, from, from the rest. Uh, So I would say that, that narrative is definitely one of our strengths. Uh, on top of that, I think that that artists say uh, all around uh, from what we've seen from many of the companies in 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 Latam uh, is pretty strong and and pretty unique. I, I think that uh, Latin American uh, artists say uh, have the capability to of making stuff that that is pretty it looks pretty natural and cool for for Western uh, markets, uh, but uh, but is kind of edgy and unique. Uh, and I think that for the most part, most of these studios have awesome uh, art uh, uh, throughout. And, and I think that that uh, also just from the um, uh, specialization perspective, it's, uh, I think it's been much easier for many of the companies and many of the countries even to, um, to create a, a talent pool around artists than it's been around engineering. Uh, although I think that most uh, of these companies had do awesome work all around, uh, I would, I would definitely put a pin on, on the art capabilities in, in Latam. Yep, I do. Yeah, and so I, I had the opportunity to visit a fair number of Colombian studios. And uh, by the way, Alejandro, thanks again for inviting me to Columbia 4.0. But one of the things that I noticed, and I not to overgeneralize, but it seemed like a lot of the studios that I visit had a similar sort of development trajectory in the sense that a lot of them started off as work for hire studios and then, you know, start to slowly start working on their own original games internally. 
and you know, it's it's like here in the San Francisco Bay Area, everyone's like a venture back, you know, <laughs> game studio. <laughs> but I, I'm wondering, is there a could, could you help me understand? Is that the typical trajectory for a lot of Latam countries? And could you speak to maybe some of the reasons why that is, or is there not a as developed sort of investment and, and financing sort of function in, in LATAM, or what would you attribute that to? Maybe Carlos can can start and yeah, I can okay. compliment. <laughs> okay, well, uh, my story is basically this, like when I founded my company, my first company, we did not have any access to a capital, to uh, a VCs, angels, so we had to do uh, uh, like work for hire and to uh, save money to do our own game. But uh, then we stayed into the, into uh, doing this until we sold at the company. So basically, through uh, ten years, all we did was basically do uh, uh, several games for uh, uh, some of the publishers. In the past years, though, like in the past five years, there are, uh, some uh, VCs started here. But frankly, it's very very hard because they don't get uh, like what the games is so it's very hard they they always want to uh for us to show what's the minimal viable product and they uh compare us with the fintech or the health tech so it's and it's a totally different business so it's a very very hard i am uh also uh a shareholder of one a vc fund here and even like i and no games, but we only managed to fund uh, like one company so far, and it's very hard now to get put, uh, to the second round because all of the other funds they don't want to talk about games here, so it's very very hard. And the uh, Brazilian government they uh, started also giving some grants, trying to help, but uh, mostly focusing in the game itself, not in the company. So this is something, but uh, like. Like you can find money for doing a, like a demo or something like this, but not for your company. So we are we have to do stuff like the uh, only way for you is to really uh, is make a, like work for hire to fund yourself. So unfortunately, we are still like it's ten years uh, behind any other tier one country. Carlos, can you can you touch on that? You mentioned VCs. So is it they don't. They aren't interested. They don't understand it. I mean, obviously, the, it's a huge industry, and that's pretty obvious to everyone. Mm -hmm. Just curious, like, the, is there something specific to the region that makes them, you know, nervous about it? I, I'm just curious <laughs> if there's no. Uh, frankly, I think that they they don't get like uh, what's the gaming industry. So, like, every time that we are doing pitches for some of the companies, like that, I'm that I'm trying to uh, help. They always try to uh, compare this with like a normal company in the health tech. So they are asking for a lot of, of things that uh, doesn't make sense it's for the gaming industry. Uh, and, and so it's very, very hard. Like it's, it's a matter of they are uh, the uh, VC uh, scene here. Uh, it's not that old. So they are now focusing more in the safe bets, which is the fintech or the health tech. and. Uh, a games is always something that they see as, is it game or or is it gambling? Sometimes I have to spend hours saying that no, this is game, this is not gambling. <laughs> so it's, it's it's really tough, yeah. And so uh, some of the companies here they are actually now uh, uh, opening uh, uh, like offices in uh, US, uh, it's Canada because it's easier is for them to uh, talk to those other uh, VCs, but there. And it gets some fun, rather than put, uh, uh, but trying to put it here. So it's really a matter of uh, uh, culture, I guess. We should always try. I always try to see if we can uh, get some of the funds there to uh, come down here to uh, in the festivals and uh, to to see if we can uh, slowly uh, try to uh, teach this. But it's super hard, unfortunately. Got it. Okay. And then maybe shifting gears a little bit and talking about uh, local content and maybe even breaking down into some more specific regional differences as well. But wondering if you guys could talk about from a local perspective, you know, uh, Josh mentioned Garena in Brazil, 
what types of games are performing well in LATAM? And then can you speak to the genres, themes, and then even specific regional differences as well? So, uh, go, please. <laughs> go <yeah. Amanda. laughs> uh, Just say from our experience, what we see is that, that um, LATAM really kind of follows trends from, from what you see in North America, like in terms of genres. Whatever top charts you see in in US, you'd very likely see uh, like an eighty or ninety percent uh, uh, match in Latam. Uh, I think that that social media and and kind of the strength of of uh, marketing power for many of the top games really kind of transcends uh, um, uh, frontiers and barriers. So if uh, casual games are in the top charts in US, you'll likely see those same uh, casual games. In LATAM, uh, throughout, uh, you'd see small variations in, in every country and probably like one breakaway uh, game. Uh, not that many, like uh, one thing that we saw before is that you'd see two or three uh, local uh, uh, games uh, here and there. But but I think that, that as time passes, that those opportunities become much more restrictive just because of the increasing uh, cost to, to market games and the increasing cost to make a uh, world-class games. So basically genres and types of games are really similar to do what you'd see uh, in North America, in, in, my, in my opinion. Got it. That's, yeah, I agree. Yeah, here it, it, like, it's uh, a same, like the uh, games that are the top grossing now, some of them are, are like uh, a Supercell games and Roblox, uh, Play Rigs, a mini clip. So it's the is is the same uh, a, a games. There is no game that is famous only here, except for as Free Fire because they think they are like another uh, beast. But uh, at the other are all the same. And what what would you guys say to the view that you know? And I, I think this view was popularized by the success of Garena Free Fire that for countries like Brazil that to the extent that you can run on lower end devices and have a lot more ad based monetization focus due to you know credit card penetration and things like that that those types of games would actually do better in Brazil and Latin America would you guys agree with that or would you disagree with that oh yes uh, like uh, i think that uh, they were very smart in uh, apporting the the a game to all of the old Android handsets. This is also something but that we are doing here for Evakin, uh, for the game that, that I'm uh, running here. We uh, are pretty much cover all of the Brazilian handsets, all of the uh, low-end handsets. And it's uh, very good because since it's a social game, like, uh, if, like if, if, if your friends are uh, not there, you will find other games that you can play with all of them. So uh, this is vital. You you should be able to port. Like if you take a look into the uh, PUBG Lite here, um, even even though they are but, but trying to uh, reach more uh, uh, cell phones, this is still not as near as the coverage that uh, those other games have. Uh, Street Fighter has. And uh, but the other thing is about the uh, local content is uh, and, and like. And like what we do here, I'm talking about my game, is that we is really focus on uh, and not only at translating everything, but rather to do some uh, a local a Brazilian content in the game. So let's say for Carnival, we had like uh, uh, a Brazilian uh, a scene with the samba schools, with the blocks, the uh, parades. So we we put a lot of stuff there, but there is sell. Um, in the game, that is only for here. We are uh, holding some uh, local music uh, is concerts in the game with the local artists. So, and we see that this uh, a mixed player to really uh, uh, play more, to uh, tell more about us with their friends. Say, hey, uh, those guys they are not only having like the football shirts; they are really putting a lot of uh, Brazilian content there. So uh, this helps a lot. And, and I have been seeing other uh, games also doing this kind of uh, the uh, local stuff is for here. And the third one is the uh, price tests. It's something that 
you have to is really test some uh, like some of the prices or if for the same money you will get like uh, more free coins or something like this. So it's important to really uh, and not just uh, like uh, put the a same uh, a tier a tag, but try to really do something uh, until you you find like what's the best price point for uh, for your players here so i think this is also something that we are doing and i see that all of the top grossing games they are really spending time doing this got it so, so given given that the latam market seem to have a global taste but you can do like some customization for the for the local audience do you think that it makes um it or does it make sense or are there any companies specifically targeting Latin America with specific products for Latin America or is it better to just have again a, a global product and then just kind of localize for for Latin? I think that in my opinion it's not too much uh, worth it and 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 probably you see less and less of that. I think that when the mobile boom started a lot of the local media companies and conglomerates started to trying to figure out how they could venture into video games. And they tried to do it with some of the local or regional uh, IPs, but, but uh, obviously they, don't, they cannot reach the scale that, that um, global uh, products do. Also uh, because um, at least if you want to have like a business model that's sustainable, uh, you'd probably want to uh, get revenue from uh, tier two, tier one uh, countries uh, besides uh, LATAM. Uh, so, so I don't think that that it makes a lot of uh, business sense, uh, and it's not an easy endeavor in free to play to do, uh, specifically from LATAM. But the other side of the coin that is interesting is that, that what you see over the last um, couple of decades, especially this last decade, where in other medium, um, Latin American artists and 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 uh, locally generated uh, content has become really popular and global. So, so. Currently, I think that the opportunity for local developers is more trying to explore that uh, local color and flavor and taste and uh, make it uh, show a little bit more into the world. So it's not more about generating a specific content for Latin America, but generating Latin American content for the world might be the bigger opportunity here. So something that I've seen, at, there's there's like a, a third side of that coin. It's a 3D coin. Uh, which something that I've seen on the uh, on the competitive side of things, though, is that certain certain companies are trying to nurture the Latin American scene. So even if they're not producing like Latin American localized content, there is definitely an interest in 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 nurturing and 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 making sure that the Latin American competitive scene is 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 healthy. And that, like the Latin American teams, are actually able to compete in the global stage. Um, Valve, for example, for the for pretty much every every uh, you know tournament in the Dota Pro Circuit has like a safe slot for South America, and there's like certain requirements for the team so that it is considered South American, not just you know five people from Europe coming over here and and opening a you know a house a gaming house in in in, in Rio and, and trying to pass out as Latin. Uh, and I think that that speaks to, you know, these companies are definitely seeing some value in having the, you know, both both critical mass from Latin America, from their players, but also, uh, you know, the differences that every region brings in, in the meta and in strategies and how, how they play out. Uh, not to, I promise myself, I wouldn't make a soccer metaphor, but to make a soccer metaphor, uh, there's definitely different gaming styles. And, and so you, it, it, the Latin American players play very, very exciting uh, in, in a lot of these games. Like the way, and they play a little crazy too, uh, probably because there's not much to lose yet because the, the scene is growing. Uh, but it, there's, the, I, I, I think that some companies are definitely seeing value in, in nurturing the, the competitive, scene, uh, competitive scene down here. Okay. Uh, there, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, there's just one thing that I uh, didn't see here, which is the games like uh, uh, choices episodes. You know, those uh, small games and narrative games. I yeah. think uh, it's something that if they start to do some uh, a local stories or uh, I, I using some of the uh, local media IPs, because we have like this huge sculpture here in the. Uh, TV series, uh, soap operas. So it's something that if they start to, to do some a partnership with the local writers here, the, the, the content, I guess this this can really go 
a super big here. It's a, I, because all like I, I didn't see any of those games really doing content for for uh, us here. So I guess this is something that if like they should be paying attention to because uh, in, in my opinion, but uh, uh, there's an opportunity here for those kinds of games with local content. Okay. And just kind of asking more about regulatory and legal issues. So certainly when in some countries like Belgium with Gacha or in Japan, when you're shutting down a game, but are there any specific regulatory or legal issues that game developers, mobile game developers need to be aware of when entering the Latin American market? Or are, are we basically okay? I think that, that in general, that time, and, and at least talking from Colombia, uh, the government is not very sophisticated in terms of uh, understanding new technologies and we're just getting acquainted with. So uh, probably I think that there's two areas where, where there might be stuff just to, 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 to look over and if there's like any specific age gating or rating uh, uh, items, uh, for example, in Brazil or, or in other countries. Uh, but in general, it's pretty open. And uh, obviously, uh, some countries have started to see that a fair amount of revenue from uh, from the population is going into digital services. So one thing that they have tried, and and at least Colombia instaurated last year, was that they added VAT uh, for digital goods and services, which is kind of transparent for for the for the developer or publisher in the sense that it's usually the platforms that have to either uh, set up a legal entity or or figure out how they're going to pay that VAT or, th or those taxes. Or in the case of Colombia, what they created was, uh, they called it like a digital uh, VAT. And if the platform didn't have a local entity or was not going to pay that tax uh, directly, they'll just put it on top of the uh, your credit card bill uh, for those services. It was originally kind of thought for Netflix or Spotify or those kind of subscriptions, but, um, but uh, I guess like, Apple, Google, anything kind of being a purchase goes in there, even Steam. So they are kind of rolling this kind of stuff out. So there might be some surprises, I guess, on, on how they roll out these models. Uh, but I don't think that, that there's anything overly uh, sophisticated about regulation in, in LATAM as of yet. Brazil, we are going to have the, the a Brazilian version of the GDPR thing, so probably uh, at this year they will start. We will have some uh, local laws about this, so it's important. Like if if you are uh, thinking about uh, having your game here, but just to read this and see if it's the same thing that you are doing for uh, some of the countries in Europe, because it's it's something that is is going to happen. It's pretty soon, so that's something that I always tell people that you should know about this new. GDPR thing coming for uh, Brazil. Uh, for here, it's called uh, LGPD. All right. And then now asking more about game marketing and promotion, can you talk about any key differences with when it comes to marketing or promotion of games in Latin America? Are there any regional differences or is there any differences between LATAM and the rest of the world? It's cheaper well, here. <laughs> uh, it's it, for starters, it's cheaper. I think. Well, I I think maybe Colombia and 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 other countries in Latin that does differ a little bit of Brazil just because of size. But but you can correct me if I'm wrong, Carlos. But here in in Colombia, there's not many major news outlets. Like like for example, for the whole of Colombia, there's two main newspapers. That's it. And if you are in those two main newspapers, you're hitting a, a pretty big percentage of the population. Same with the, like radio stations, you know, um, well, well, right now the TV stations are struggling a little bit just because of Netflix and this whole thing, but, but pretty much media is, is, is quite centralized. So it's a lot easier to make a splash with, with fewer resources. Um, so I guess that goes on the, on the cheaper side, but also it has to do with, you know, you know, how big your networking has to be and how much PR effort has to be done to actually be, you know, to, to actually be noticed. That's one part of it. The other part of it, you know, is that marketing is like, like conceptually is lagging a little bit behind too. And so there's stuff like, uh, you know, performance based marketing, uh, and, 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 you know, things like that, that, that are still not very well understood by everyone. And so there's still a lot of, uh, you know, a, uh, a lot of people, even influencers still think about, you know, bringing value through branding and, you know, a lot of, a lot of like uh, more traditional marketing endeavors and, uh, and, but slowly but surely we're, we're starting to get there. 
Okay. And then in, in terms of like word of mouth, is that a key promotional strategy in LATAM? And then how can developers leverage that channel if possible? Okay. Well, uh, it's, it's something that is, that is totally right. So we are actually doing a lot of stuff here to get more uh, players using this. And let's say uh, every time that, that we are doing some uh, like uh, in-game concert with Panarstis, uh, of course, we are selling items there. But also it's, it is helping us so that this artist also uh, tells everybody that he or she is going to uh, play uh, in the game. So it's a way for us to get more people that maybe didn't know about us or uh, maybe didn't play, but they say, hey, if this artist is uh, playing there in uh, this game, I will go check it out. So we are using this a lot and uh, it really works, uh, especially if you are uh, like a social game. So we do a, a lot of stuff, let's say, oh, uh, tag a friend, uh, promotions, those kinds of uh, stuff but that we do, not only in the game, uh, but in the social networks but that we have. So this is also something but, but that we do that, that is helping us to uh, grow here. And it's totally based on people inviting others to uh, take a picture in the game so they have to uh, install and play. So yeah, it works a lot here in Brazil at least. Josh? I think that LATAM in general is super social. So like uh, social networks exploded uh, pretty fast. Uh, I know that, that Brazil uh, didn't jump into Facebook as fast because of Orkut and, and other reasons, but but uh, people are uh, right now hyper-connected, hyper-social. And, uh, and I think that, that games can really leverage on top of that, all of the social hooks uh, being that kind of incentivize the invites or stuff like that. We're constantly trying new uh, new approaches uh, to, to this, uh, being either dynamic links or using kind of the, the social graph uh, or those channels to, to market the game is super important. And I think that for that time is one of the key aspects that can even kind of help reduce even more the user acquisition costs for, for Latin America and can kind of level out a little bit more the playing field in, in making the ROI positive for, for a game here. All right, last section. So uh, kind of poorly titled market success, but really just providing some more insights, I think, to you know, our audience, who's obviously you know, a lot of folks outside of the region, just helping you know, getting into some of the more details about you know, how can they be more successful in the region. And I think we've, we've actually touched on a lot of them. Um, I think, uh, you know, one thing right off the bat is sort of localization. So my assumption is to really have success in the majority of markets in, uh, in the region, you have to do, you know, translate your game, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, my assumption is that's just a table stakes. Like there's not really going to be, you're not going to have much success if you don't, you know, do that localization. If unless you're maybe a hyper casual game or something, would anyone disagree with that, or is that pretty universally totally right? <laughs> uh, totally, totally right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and it and because uh, basically, for my you know, for those who are less sophisticated like me, so basically you know, Portuguese, Brazil, and then outside of that uh, is Spanish for all the other main countries. Correct. Correct. But the one thing to note, though, is that the cultural differences in, in LATAM, uh, like um, Spanish speaking Latin America is not like a single country, although many <laughs> think like it's one huge Mexico. It's very, very, very diverse and very varied. So you have to be super careful uh, or very diligent if you want to have like a Spanish LATAM Spanish translation, especially if your game touches like in the case of World War II, where we have uh, things around the popular culture or and humor, trying mm -hmm. to make something that 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 is understandable, funny, and and touches on, on stuff that is familiar to you, and can work from Mexico to Argentina is is not as easy as it sounds. So so yeah. you better kind of get some good advice or, or a very good localization agency or linguist that really understand those nuances. If, if also you have audio, uh, the accents. 
it's really you like like you can really feel you feel like a foreign game even if it's in spanish if there's like a for us for columbus if there's like a very strong argentinian accent it's you know it it, it feels off uh because of where you know how we pronounce words and, and actually how we accent certain words etc so definitely that's some, something else to look into if you are localizing for got it so basically i think besides just the translation is really having somebody who's maybe plays the game and understands the game, you know, hopefully maybe take a look to make sure, especially if there's narrative or these kind of themes yep. that aren't literally going to be like menus or something translated. Okay. That's, you know, definitely a, a, a key point. Um, all right. So we talked about, uh, you know, devices um, a, a lot. And I think, you know, if you want to really penetrate, especially sounds like Brazil, you really need to support the lower end Android devices. I mean, do you guys, uh, I mean, maybe I'll focus on Carlos. Do you see that as being an issue for a lot of the top games uh, coming from, you know, say, you know, Europe, North America? Is that a, is that a large issue where a lot of the, the performance is very poor? Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. uh, basically, I think that uh, a Fortnite here for cell phones and uh, PUBG, they are suffering from, from this because they are, uh, it's like only if you have like a, 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 like an iPhone 8 or a 10 or if you have like the Samsung the Galaxy S9 and they run it fine so it uh, hurts uh, for sure and the second aspect as I mentioned is to really do some uh, a local a price points here uh, a local offers is something that we are always doing stuff for the carnival or for some of the holidays and that we have here some of the festive dates so it's important because then uh, like your players uh, feel that you are really doing stuff is for them. Uh, uh, the way that you also talk in the uh, social media, you, you, you should try to talk, uh, maybe talk with using the same, uh, the same things that are happening in the country, uh, like the uh, uh, local uh, uh, means that, that we have. So it's important to uh, at least have uh, somebody that is on the ground just uh, checking uh, like what's happening. You don't have to open uh, like a new office here, hire 20 people, but it's important to have uh, somebody but, but uh, that, is look, uh, that is taking care of this because it's very hard to just say that, okay, and now in uh, Brazil, it's the uh, carnival time, so let's do samba stuff. Uh, but it's not just samba. We have like seven other rhythms, 10 other style so it's important for the uh, for the players to feel that you really know what's happening here if not they will say okay there is but just another a gringo as we call it but trying to uh, mimic <laughs> that they are here and they really get very pissed off if if they notice this so really important too <laughs> One thing that I'd like to add on the performance bit, I, I, as Carlos says, I, we cannot stress how important that is. And, and we've seen it throughout. We like try to pull some aggregate numbers comparing device models between regions. And what we've seen in that time is that the, like the top devices would be mid to low end tier devices. And they would like, if you take the top 15, it would be go all the way to like mid to low tier, just remain from mid to low tier. If you compare to, for example, US or, or Western Europe, you'd see high end to mid uh, on those devices. And, and also it's, it's not only kind of that, that those tier devices are lower uh, performance, but also the perception from players. We get a lot of comments from players saying, I have a brand new J2 device and it's super high end. And, and when you look at the specs, it's like, it's, it's pretty crappy and, and you can really kind of run the game on it. So the perception on the player is that their device is actually much higher performance than, than it really is, or at least compared to, to kind of top tier. So so kind of just keeping a big eye and, and looking and, and benchmarking, trying to optimize uh, for that is super important. Uh, trying to support uh, as a big of a device pool as you can, uh, can also impact your user acquisition costs and 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 in general, kind of the, the, the engagement of the game. Got it. <clears throat> Carlos, uh, just quickly, when you think about um, the price, you'd mentioned testing price points. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 
how are you kind of approaching that at, as the early stage? I mean, you, you know, have Avic in life and you're looking at Brazil. I mean, how, how would you, I guess, how would you suggest for other developers to think about that? Um, you know, if they're sort of interested in maybe growing their sort of revenue potential in say Brazil or somewhere in Latin America. Oh, sure. Uh, I think uh, the first step is for you to really try to uh, have those uh, players to uh, break the barrier of uh, doing the first time as purchase. So you you uh, might want to test like a uh, super uh, cheap uh, pack I, I keep just to see if they will uh, pay. So put uh, like you can put it like uh, 50 cents pack something like this and but you also have to uh, um, sometimes it's but not only like uh, just the price but uh, like what they get from it so you can also add a lot of extra stuff like extra skins for, for your game or the uh, as, uh, like also something that I'm seeing here now uh, growing is the a subscription for uh, some of those games so they they have like the second tier which is okay if you if you pay five bucks a month you get a lot of coins a lot of uh free stuff so it's but you you it's really have to test everything but also be careful because if your game is a competitive then some of the other players around they might might uh and know but that you are doing this here they will change their VPNs just to abide from here. So it's you have to really stay care, like be extra as careful if your game is a, a competitive one. But it's a matter of it's really testing, like every day uh, A/B testing, and uh, also uh, tie this into your uh, e e e like into your e e UA because then, uh, like once you 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 are getting like uh, the ROI uh, is positive. Then you just open, the, like the, then you really start to put more uh, money. But it's it's uh, not easy. It requires a, a lot of uh, tasks, but it's doable. And it's uh, not only about ad based. Like it's really IAPs. Like it's something that that I'm seeing here and some other games like uh, uh, Free Fire. They are making I, I don't know it's five million dollars a year just on. IAP, so it's it's really impressive, like the amount of money that uh, they are doing, and some of the other top games are doing here. Got it. <clears throat> and Alejandro, you spoke about this a little bit uh, at the beginning, but for those who are not as uh, knowledgeable, you know, obviously, you know, we're used to here in say US, we have credit card, you have various payment methods. Uh, whereas in a lot of countries, Latin America, like even if people want to pay you know, payment method support is, is more challenging because they don't have, uh, you know, bank accounts or, or you know, credit cards. Um, you know, I, I think Apple and Google have made improvements in those areas, but like, you know, do you still think there's a pretty big gap to allow, you know, uh, users to monetize even who want to in a lot of the countries? Totally. Uh, like in, in, in Colombia and, and, and what you see in many countries in Latin America, still a lot of people pay their utilities uh, by either going to the bank or going, for example, in Colombia, there's a network called uh, called uh, Baloto. There you sell a uh, lot of tickets, but the, because they have so many points of service in around Colombia, uh, a lot of people, for example, if you want to buy uh, stuff uh, on on like an analogous version of, of Amazon here, some e-commerce, you'd end up going uh, taking a, a bus to one of those uh, uh, places and paying with real money, and they will transfer that into an electronic uh, uh, kind of a, a version of it so you can pay for goods and a lot of uh, like uh, Apple and Google still do not support a lot of these uh, payment methods which sound pretty weird but are pretty commonplace for people that don't have access to credit cards uh, in, in the region. Uh, I know that, that, uh, that uh, there's always kind of efforts being done on both platforms to support more and more payment methods. But I think that that's uh, only opens the opportunity uh, more and more for players to spend, uh, players who actually want to spend and understand the, the, the value uh, proposition in those. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like a, an opportunity, hopefully, that will improve over time. Um, 
Carlos, you want to, I know you've done, let's talk about sort of ad monetization. Obviously mm-hmm. it's become very popular in general uh, with the hyper casual sort of, you know, landscape. Um, you know, what does that look like in, uh, in the Latin American region? Obviously, um, you know, we talk about lower user acquisition costs, which means it's probably lower, but um, it also sounds like a lot of users, you know, can't spend money. So they're probably happy to engage with ads. So oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, it's something that we have been seeing here is that uh, besides of the of uh, just seeing ads from uh, some of the games, we we were seeing uh, at least until this whole uh, situation came for as for the virus, but uh, a lot of other apps uh, for the uh, travel industry or or for or, or uh, uh, ads that are and uh, but not like for a CPI based but uh, brands trying to have ads there so it's it's something but that was growing super fast until this whole madness happened but uh, at, so it's something that we are seeing uh, some of the uh, local ad agencies they are starting to as uh, cut deals with the fashion brands so that they also have ads in the games so this is uh, also something and uh, stuff that that we are doing also is to not only sell ads but sells those ads as an experience in the game so instead of uh just uh showing uh, uh like an ad for a fashion brand we can we can have at least in in our game to have like their new clothes in the game so it's uh it's uh, like an experience is for the player not only ads uh but it's growing uh, as super fast, of course, we uh, but, but, uh, I took this hit now, but the whole world is kind of uh, scaling down. But it's a very good way to monetize here, for sure. Cool. All right. I think uh, any other thoughts around uh, sort of this areas of how, you know, foreign developers can be more successful before we wrap up? Um, I would add something that I, I, I personally have found challenging, which is the the fact that well, because of the way that wealth is distributed in Latam, you you the middle class, as I mentioned, is is, is thinner, and that has made hitting the uh, like the the sweet spot for IAP a little bit harder because it it also varies like heavily between between platforms, at least in mobile, between Google and iOS. Uh, so that that is definitely something that that you need to be on the lookout for. Uh, because it's not it's not an easy not to crack i think awesome definitely cool all right so i think we'll we'll wrap up here we like to do kind of the final word um you know from each of you guys kind of i don't know i wrote top two things that uh you know the audience you want to make sure the audience takes away uh when they think about this market um you know from the business perspective or otherwise um so yeah, I don't know. It could be about anything, Carlos. I'll let you go first. Top, okay, top, sure. top two things. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that first uh, here, like it's a is an excellent uh, a choice if you want to a soft launch of uh, things with uh, a very big user base because like it's a a cheap people play like hell here. So it's a it's something that if you have a game that uh, that you really need like a lot of players are playing it. You can certainly uh, do your uh, soft launch here. And uh, besides this, it's a matter, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, now people are really spending money. So I guess some uh, some publishers will get very good uh, surprise here, like knowing that okay, yes, this is actually being ROI positive. So I, I think that it's a, a right time now to invest more here and to try to grow some of those titles it's really paying off here for, for us awesome alejandro sure i i think that that as i mentioned before latam is super receptive to to western uh, content and popular culture so i think that 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 anything that has the potential to trend kind of in in, in north america or europe will definitely have a shot a shot here uh, and if you kind of understand that american culture and flavor and how we perceive a kind of stuff. You can even be a little bit edgier and a, a little bit uh, more vocal and, and that would still fly 
uh, even at tone of political incorrectness and, and whatnot, uh, can go a long way here. Uh, also, uh, in our case, we actually la soft launched uh, our game in LATAM to what Carlos was saying is an uh, incredible opportunity engagement. In LATAM can be pretty comparable to, 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 to other uh, Western uh, geos, if not uh, even better. So it's always a good opportunity also because we are in similar time zone uh, to, uh, for example, North America, uh, getting a, a critical mass, for example, on a multiplayer game out of LATAM is also a huge opportunity because it's super cost effective to, to grow and, and players can still engage uh, with the uh, players in North America or in Europe, uh, given the, the similar time zone. So it's uh, also a good opportunity to, to think, especially when you're doing multiplayer or, or like synchronous uh, content uh, to take that into consideration. Awesome. Hiro. The final, wow. final word. The final, final word. Wow. Uh, so I think building on Carlos's uh, point, uh, mentioning that how IAP is starting to like get get some, uh, you know, some some impetus in in Latam, I would definitely advise that when you design and, and are like creating your your your, your journey for your players, I, I think that Latin Americans are a little bit like electricity. We we tend to take the path of least resistance wherever there's like an opportunity not to pay or, to, you know, like like we'll go through that and we do not mind grinding and, and all that good stuff. Uh, so definitely be mindful of that when you are designing your game and, and you're planning it for the Latin American market. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys. Everyone uh, listening, make sure to download uh, Avakin Life and World War Doe. And uh, otherwise, JK, any final, final, final comments no comments thanks a lot guys so much for thanks. for joining and oh if people do want to reach out to you uh, i'll if you can um give me permission i'll put your contact information in the show notes for definitely sure. great thank you guys for having us this was fantastic thank you guys a lot of fun. Yeah. It was really fun bye-bye stay safe stay safe bye. everyone bye bye